there are a lot of developments which have happened in the last uh, hundred years. Rapid developments which have changed the outlook of urolithiasis in the 21st uh, century. There is a multifactorial origin. We are more and more aware of how these stones are developing. The socioeconomic status of the people have improved, which has really significantly improved the dietary pattern. And the dietary pattern has really affected the type of stones which you form, where you form the stones. So there is a significant uh, shift from the bladder calculate to renal calculate. Nowadays, we are seeing more and more uh, renal calculate than the bladder calculate. So treatment also is uh, different. There are genetic factors, there are a lot of uh, drugs which produce uh, stones, diets are there, there are anatomical uh, abnormalities which form stones. Olden days, people with anatomical abnormalities used to die. And nowadays, we are identifying more and more metabolic abnormalities with uh, stone disease, which helps in uh, pharmacological manipulation which can reduce the stone disease. So, all of them have uh, really changed the scenario in which the stones have been treated from the open and run uh, scenario. We are getting nowadays more and more uh, smaller stones, better methods of treatment which includes the drugs and the surgical uh, treatment. One significant improvement in the management of stone disease is by the imaging technologies which have come. There were no imaging technologies in olden days other than the clinical sense and unless the stone becomes so big, you cannot uh, identify it. Nowadays, we can identify stones which are very small and the starting easily available investigation of an ultrasound which will easily pick up uh, small, small stones in the kidney which are amenable to various forms of uh, treatment. So, radiology has made a significant uh, difference in the early identification of stones so that we can manage it uh, appropriately. The second important thing is the X-ray technologies have improved from uh, ordinary X-ray to CT scans to plain CT scans to spiral CT scans. So, even smaller stones can be detected very accurately now. So, there is no, uh, no role for a speculation and you can treat exactly where is the stone, what is the density of the stone, what type of treatment uh, you can uh, do for the stone. So, a significant change has happened in the last 100 years in the diagnosis and in the understanding of the stone disease, which has really changed the management of stone from the olden days uh, lithotomy. Nowadays, if you have a renal stone, we do what is called a percutaneous uh, nephrolithotomy, where you put a small instrument into the kidney, the commonly called a terminology of a keyhole uh, surgery, where you can put it into the kidney. We have nice anesthesia now. There are a lot of antibiotics which are available now, which has made the surgical treatment uh, very safe, which was not there in the Hippocrates, oh, uh, Hippocratic period where people used to die. Nowadays, we have antibiotics, we have anesthetic agents and good uh, post-operative care. You can put smaller and smaller instruments into the kidney. It can be a rigid uh, nephroscope or a flexible nephroscope and you can easily treat these stone. There are no parts of the urinary system which you cannot access under vision. Right from the urethra to the renal calyx, you can uh, see. You can put an instrument into the ureter, you can put a ureteroscope and you can see the stone and you can uh, break it with uh, various energy sources. They commonly use the terminology of a rigid ureteroscope with uh, lithotripsy. You can easily see and treat the stone. You don't have to cut and pull it and uh, run away like the old uh, lithotomy. So, surgery has become more and more uh, refined. And even instruments have become more and more uh, flexible so that you don't have to put some rigid instrument into the ureter. You can put a flexible instrument and the various energy sources which are available starting from an ultrasound, an electrohydraulic lithotripsy, a pneumatic lithotripsy, a laser lithotripsy. So, you don't have to take stone out in that. You can break it with one of these energy sources which have become very effective and you can treat the stone. So, we have a wide, variety, a wide array of instruments starting from small instruments to rigid instruments to flexible instruments, very good optics you can see wherever you want and you can see and break the stones. Instruments have become smaller and smaller, they have become miniaturized, very good uh, ultrasound and uh, effective uh, breaking uh, energy sources are available and nowadays we are in the era of a laser where you can have small flexible fibers which can be passed through small instruments which can go and see and break the stone. You have to see the stone so which optics are uh, optics is required and you can uh, break with small energy sources so lasers have come which means that for an effective stone treatment, you have a wide array of instruments which are available so that you don't have to have one of those uh, crude instruments to catch and grasp the stone and uh, run. You have PCNL, you have ureteroscopy and you have cystolithotripsy where the stones can be very easily cleared. One major intervention which has happened is shockwave lithotripsy where the energy sources from a, uh, from a bubble 
will break the stone, which means that you don't have to treat the patient uh, seeing the stone. You can do it without anesthesia, where the patient lies down on a machine. And on the right side, you can uh, see a modern machine where which is targeted by an ultrasound or the stone is localized by a CM, break it with the energy source and that is the end of it. The treatment which will last for 25 to 30 minutes or even 40 minutes, which doesn't require anesthesia, which doesn't require major antibiotics, no major interventions and the person who has uh, invented it, uh, Christian uh, Chaucy. ESWL, the shockwave lithotripsy has made a major uh, uh, inroad into the way in which we can uh, treat uh, stones. So right now for managing stones, we have a wide uh, spectrum of uh, instruments and the uh, skills which are available miniaturized instruments, good energy sources and even without uh, touching the patient with a machine you can break the stone. What is the role of open surgery now? In this era of uh, these miniaturized instruments, this is an article which has come, the art of open surgery to train or not to train. As trainers, this is what we are uh, facing now. Now the current generation of residents, whether we should treat them to do open surgery, we have trained in, uh, we are trained in open surgery, we can easily do. This is an article which has come as early as 2006, 10 years ago. There was a thought whether stone surgery is required because most of the residents now, they don't have an exposure for stone surgery. So is stone surgery going to be an art which Hippocrates long time back has predicted that I will not cut for uh, stones. But there is another group of highly specialist people who are coming out who are called the endourologists. The urology has specialized into an endourology who can do complex endoscopic and laparoscopic uh, procedures where open surgery has become a rare event. And uh, probably open surgery will become a highly specialized uh, speciality now because less and less people will be qualified enough to do an open surgical uh, procedure. More and more residents are trained in utilizing the newer methods of removing the stone disease. So Hippocrates oath is uh, now revisited. I will not cut for stone even for patients in whom the disease is manifest. So Hippocrates at that time, because of the complications, he has said that I will not cut for uh, stones. I will leave this operation to be performed by practitioners. So first time he thought about uh, urology. Now urology is again evolving into a subspeciality called endourology, where urologists themselves may not be treating for uh, stones. Patients will not accept if you say that I will uh, remove a stone by a lithotomy. They want a non-surgical uh, treatment of stones. So down the line, even now stone surgery is becoming a rare event. If you do a stone surgery, open stone surgery, we will never see a stone like this in uh, future. It is gone now. People will not see a stone which can keep it as a memento on their uh, table. Nowadays, we are, stones are becoming small. Open surgery is becoming a rare uh, surgical uh, procedure and I foresee a future where stone disease is going to be completely treated, probably non-interventionally. The most common dietary factor which has been identified for stone disease is less intake of uh, water. So probably more and more people are uh, taking lesser and lesser of water. First one. The second one is uh, there are a lot of uh, high intake of animal proteins and uh, proteins which are not normal for the regular diet. So protein intake has increased because of the industrial revolution. We are having more and more money to afford the high quality protein. Protein intake has really increased. That is producing hypercalciuria. Hypercalciuria produces more and more stones. Along with that, hypocitrate urea will come. That will again produce more and more stones. So right now, one single pointer is not there. Less water, the diet has changed. That has shifted the stones from the bladder to the kidney. So we are seeing more and more stones in the kidney than in the bladder. One uh, good thing about uh, blood is blood will clot, but unfortunately urine will not uh, clot. So once you put a needle and injure or uh, put an instrument and injure the kidney, usually it heals on its own. Body has given, God has given us an ability to heal by secondary intention, primary intent, it heals. As long as there is no obstruction. If there is an obstruction because of a stone, of a fragment of a stone which remains there, it will not heal. So normally if you puncture the kidney and do any procedure percutaneously, it heals on its own. But if there is a bleeding, we may have to do some techniques, uh, some of the sealants or injectables or one of the embolizing agents we have to do to reduce the bleeding. So percutaneous surgery, less than 1% of the patient also only will develop significant bleeding. God heals on its own, intrinsic and extrinsic factors of coagulation. Sorry, 
Any stone surgery will destroy the nephrons, any stone surgery. Among the techniques which I have described about percutaneous nephrolithotomy, open nephrolithotomy or an extracorporeal nephrolithotomy, studies have proved that uh, all are acceptable. So, percutaneous nephrolithotomy is acceptable because we have a lot of reserved nephrons which will uh, heal. And we have done a study where we have done the functional pattern of that area with a DMSA scan which produces a scar and it will not affect the overall function as a whole unless the procedure damages the renal artery or vein as a major complication which doesn't happen. So, if it is a safe surgery, it is uh, acceptable. There will be more than the necrosis, uh, we are uh, separating the renal parenchyma and going inside. Necrosis will happen if in that process there is an artery which gets uh, obstructed, that area will go into necrosis, it heals with a scar. So, postoperatively these kidneys will be seen with a scar in the kidney. Shockwave lithotripsy works in the principle uh, where the uh, second world war they put a uh, dam bursters into the water, it will produce an energy wave and where there is an impedance it gets, uh, it will break that thing. So, if there is a calcified uh, renal artery or a calcified aneurysm that can get damaged. So, an abnormal, it can uh, fracture the bone because if you don't target it properly, it can break the bone because bone is an impedance. But more important than that, there will be some amount of damage to the kidney. It can uh, stimulate the, uh, the vagus nerve because it is surrounding that. It can produce acute uh, little bit of pancreatitis. So, surrounding area some which is acceptable uh, for the procedure. But major complications are when there is a aneurysm or a calcified area then you will can produce problems. It is there are two theories of uh, stone formation. One stone formation theory is it forms in the collecting duct. There are some conditions like renal tubular acidosis, medullary sponge kidney where it forms in the collecting ducts. The collecting ducts are dilated, so there will be infection there and it forms a phosphate stone which will erode into the kidney. It will erode into the renal uh, calyx and then it forms a bigger stone. There are some other stones uh, where the crystals are engulfed by the lymphatics which form under the subepithelial layer, they are called the Randall's plaque. So, both ways it can uh, happen. There is something called a Randall's plaque which are subepithelial uh, crystal deposits which will again form bigger stones and it erodes into the renal into the uh, calyx and then it becomes a bigger stone. If it is an obstruction with infection that forms primarily in the renal pelvis or in the calyx. So, a metabolic stone forms in the collecting duct or in the subcapsular subepithelial area. An obstruction stone or an infection stone form primarily in the in the renal uh, collecting system. And there are some stones like uh, triamterene stones uh, and uh, indinavir stones. They all will form because of the concentration. Again, they form in the ducts and then they come into the collecting system. Whenever there is a stone which blocks the ureter, that is the worst scenario where the whole ureter is blocked, so whole kidney is blocked and if there is a secondary infection of that, it produces a lot of damage to the kidney. But if there is a stone which is there in the collecting duct, it will not be blocking the other parts of the parenchyma, so there won't be any problem. So, if a ureter is blocked by a stone, that is the worst scenario where the whole uh, there will be secondary infection and the whole damage will be there for the whole kidney. But if it is formed in the calyx, nothing will happen, it will remain there. So, that is the changing scenario which we are seeing now because the CT scans are more and more uh, sensitive. So, now if you see a CT, there will be small stones seen in the calyx and more and more patients come with that finding. They do not require any treatment, but it is since it is detected early, it creates lot of problems for uh, to advise what to prevent. They are not probably stones, one of the early stages which may not have been picked up because we have done a CT only it is picked up. So, very early stage we are detecting now which may not be relevant. If it is in the kidney, it is in the calyx, there is an entity called a stagon calculus where it is there in the pelvis, where it is in the calyx, where in the end. So, we can use a flexible scope, we can access the pelvis either through the ureter and through a flexible scope we can go anywhere into the calyx. And confined? Yes. One, yes. Confined to one area, not in the multiple No, no, it can be in the multiple areas. We can access all the calyx through in, uh, the instruments which are available now. So, we do not have to do an open surgery. It is accessible either through the ureter uh -huh. or you make a hole from above and come. So, whole kidney is accessible. Oh, through one incision? Not incision, oh. one or two. Two prints. Yes, two prints. you can enter. You can access to the entire. That means you can move through the Flexible scopes will uh, move. Uh -huh. Without causing any damage to these. 
acceptable damage. Acceptable damage. Yes. That is where the technology has uh, made a difference, where the tip of the scopes can move 120 degree retrograde and you can pass smaller instruments through that. That is where the laser fiber has helped because you cannot pass a bigger instrument. Flexible instruments we can pass. So, the whole of the kidney is accessible. There are 11 to 14 calluses in the kidney. All the calluses are accept accessible from the urethra. You don't have to go here. And the stones are sucked or No, no. They are, uh, they are broken. And it comes out in the urine. It's not sucked, it comes out in the urine. For sucking the stones, you require another channel. So the instrument becomes bigger. So you break and leave it, patient passes in the <laughs> Patients take all these medications. I always allow them to take it if they want. I don't prescribe. Because I am yet to find, uh, and I don't know. Really, we don't know because these are medications which nobody has tried. There are uh, so many medications available. Some of the patients take water and they pass the stone. So, they are uh, agree on water. Some of the patients take buttermilk and pass the stone. So, they take tell buttermilk, they will pass the stone. Some take uh, that muse of pith, uh, that uh, plant and one. So, they, so, as long as it is not harmful, let them take. Uh, I don't prescribe. Because techno legally we are not supposed to prescribe non-allopathic medications. Lot of these come under the dietary preparations. Again, there is no problem of prescribing. But the problem of medical uh, treatment for stone disease is how long to treat. It is almost lifelong. And they are not cheap. You cannot take for two weeks and stop it. You have to continue lifelong to prevent stones.